My dear respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is nothing more precious and important than the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a foundation, brothers and sisters, that our very existence is built on. When I decided to speak about witchcraft and its contemporary forms and types, and likewise the shirk in its contemporary forms and types, that which I had in mind without a shadow of a doubt, my brothers and my sisters, is the tawheed of an individual. Like I said, it is the most precious and most important thing that an individual possesses. And these two aspects that I just mentioned, a sihr and also a shirk, is that which is going to destroy that which is most precious to you. Even when you look at the hadith of Abi Huraita radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, اجتنبوا سبع مبقات Stay away from the seven destructive sins. What were the first two? الشرك بالله To associate partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And also what? Witchcraft, sihr, magic. These two brothers and sisters will leave you outside the fold of Islam. If one engages or practices a shirku billahi azza wa jal, and likewise magic, witchcraft, these spells that are so common, especially in places like Bradford, it will either cause your tawheed to diminish or it will cancel it altogether. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in the Quran, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih, wa yaghfiru ma duna dalik. If an individual, my brothers and my sisters, impregnates his own mother, and then eventually ends up killing her, and even after killing her, he hides her body, which no one comes to know about. This type of sin, brothers and sisters, will be considered an act that takes you out the fold of Islam or a major sin. It would be considered a major sin. And the fact that we're saying it's a major sin, we shouldn't think it's only a major sin. A major sin is not a light matter, brothers and sisters. When a sister that we know becomes impregnated outside of wedlock is a big deal. Everyone's speaking about it on the street, right? It's a huge thing in the community. That good girl that grew up, right, wearing the hijab, going to madrasa, subhanallah, she got impregnated by Mark. It's a big deal. Everyone's speaking about it. May Allah Azza wa protect our daughters, our sisters, and our wives from that. Yes, even our wives. There are cases that reach us from time to time. If one brothers and sisters dies upon that which I just mentioned and he had his tawheed, he did not ever commit shirk. What is a shirk? It is to associate partners of Allah Azza wa When you carry out an act of worship, it should only be for who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your salah, you wouldn't pray to somebody in the grave, right? Or you wouldn't pray to Nuh or Jesus. Alayhi salatu wasalam, or even the Prophet wasallam. If I did that, everybody would come up to me and say, listen, this is shirk billah, you shouldn't do so. You should stay away from it and refrain from it. Right? Because this will what? Destroy your tawheed. So to take an act of worship and to then attribute it to other than Allah Azza wa Jal, or to ascribe it to other than Allah Azza wa Jal, this would take you at the fold of Islam. And I'm hoping, inshallah ta'ala, is pretty straightforward. Tayyip, this individual was a barbaric, bloodthirsty individual. Like the one who killed a hundred. I'm sure most of you guys are all acquainted with the hadith. He killed a hundred. He was committing the worst of the sins. Right? He died upon that. Where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admit him into? Al-Jinnah, right? That's a very famous, well-known story. Anyone else now that dies upon that, impregnated his own mother, right? And then ended up killing her and the, and, and the child inside of the stomach. 
and then buried her in a place that nobody knows where. في هذه التوحيد العقيدة of أهل السنة والجماعة the belief of أهل السنة is that he's under the will of Allah. He's under the will of Allah. Allah may choose to forgive him, or He may choose to punish him. Does that make sense? And if Allah chooses to punish him, sooner or later he will come out of the hellfire because of that verse in the Quran. And so many of the other hadith that have been authentically reported. Someone may say, oh, Allah, I'll just go into the hellfire, enjoy my life now, go into the hellfire for a little bit and then I'll come out. As long as I have a tawheed. Prophet Wasallam told us that the fire that you kindle with in this dunya is one seventieth of the fire in the hereafter. We're struggling under the British hot weather. 40 degrees. We can't bear it. We're struggling. Right? We're having a hard time dealing with it. You think you're going to be able to huh, bear the fire of the hereafter? 170. You know the fire here that you get burnt by from time to time? And then you need to use Vaseline for the whole week. It's 170th, brothers and sisters. So anyways, that's pertaining to a major sin. One may be qawwamun fil layl, sawwamun fil nahar. He stands up every night praying to Allah Azza wa Jal, engaging in the night prayer, which is the way of the righteous, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Alaykum bi qiyam al-layl fa inu da'bu al-salihin min qablikum. Upon you is to pray at night. Indeed, this is the way of the righteous before you. Right? Every night he prays. And then every day, brothers and sisters, you see him fasting. Hmm? However, just one time, one time, he decided to invoke the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I spent approximately six years in Medina. Just about every time when I go past the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grave, you see somebody standing there like that. Wallahi, you see somebody standing there like that, saying all sorts of things. Because I don't understand Urdu, it's mainly from the Asian community. I would ask if I was with an Urdu speaking brother, what is he saying? And he would drop his head. The man's calling onto the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? But he prayed every single night to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. A prayer that is very, very difficult to wake up for. Right? And then he would fast throughout the day. And he did that once. He's never ever coming out of the hellfire. And that is because he has partaken in the act of shirk. Right? If he dies upon that, dies upon that. This is a very important restriction. Allah says he does not forgive his shirk, meaning if he dies upon it. However, if he repents from it, before that, and before he departs from this world, Allah is Ghafur Rahim. Allah will forgive him, inshaAllah ta'ala. Just like somebody who embraces Al Islam. Right? He embraced Al Islam and he was carrying out all types of shirk, calling on to Jesus and whatever have you. Right? This is just in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, a tawheed and a shirk. So you have these major sins which are very serious, which blows people's minds. When something like that takes place in a community, and then you have that what? It's referred to as major shirk and major kufr. Okay? And then you have something in between, brothers and sisters. A type of sin that is in between, that who can tell me what that is? Between major shirk and also what? And major sins. What's in between? Minor shirk. Jazakallah khair. Fatihallahu alik. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna akhwa fa ma akhafu alaykum. That which I fear the most for you is the minor shirk. The Messenger was asked, What is the minor shirk? He said, Showing off. Showing off with your football skills? A bit like me, I used to show off my skills all the time. I was a superstar back in the day. I even had trials for West Ham. Huh? So, me showing off with my football skills, is that minor shirk? Or my basketball skills? Give you all of you guys a run for your money. Huh? What are we referring to? Showing off in what, brothers? In your acts of worship. The scholars, they differed. The minor shirk here that the Messenger ﷺ spoke about, showing off in your acts of worship. 
Does it have the same rulings as the major sins? Or does it have the same ruling as the major shirk? Wallahi, there's different opinion among scholars. Imagine now. Some say if he dies after having showed off in his prayer. He died straight after. And he was showing off in an act of worship. It's like committing major shirk. If he dies and he never repented from that, he's never coming out of the hellfire. And some said, the same rulings pertaining to major sins apply here. Meaning it's under the will of Allah. Allah may choose to punish him for it. Allah may choose to forgive him. And if Allah chooses to punish him for that act, sooner or later he will come out of the hellfire. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Minor shirk is not a light matter. Or minor kufr is not a light matter. If we become flabbergasted at a woman becoming impregnated by a kafir guy in the community, everyone starts speaking about it. It should shock us even more when we hear about someone having fallen into minor shirk or even worse than that, major shirk. May Allah Azza wa protect us from that. Right. So our discussion, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is contemporary shirki and magic acts that are very common in today's day and age. And I have a whole list of points right, written down here that I've been collecting over the years. I teach Kitab to hate on the Knowledge College. It's a five-year course. It's an online program. I'm in charge of teaching Kitab to hate. Depending on how it's taught, it could seem like that this kitab, this book is out of touch with reality. However, me coming from a background where I myself visited a magician. If you guys want, inshallah, I'll tell you guys about it. People love stories, especially magical ones. That's why Harry Potter became so... Well, yeah, so very well received. And also doing a lot of grave worshipping acts. It comes from a place deep under Allah. When I teach it, due to what I, who's no different to you guys, we all grew up in the UK. I was involved in a lot of crime activity when I was in London. And then I moved to Al Yemen in order to seek knowledge. And when I went to seek knowledge, thinking that Allah Azza wa Jalla saved me, I found myself doing acts that I can only thank Allah Azza wa Jal for having guided me away from that. I, I, brothers and sisters, used to pray in front of graves. I prayed in the so, or should I say, the supposed qabr, grave of Hud alayhi salatu wasalam, who was supposedly buried in Hadramaut, Yemen. And every year, over there, they would go out and reside around the grave for some time. I myself prayed in front of it. You know how you go into the masjid, you pray to hate the masjid, right? You pray two rak'at as a greeting. We would go there and start praying in front of it. And everyone was just standing around it or facing towards the prayer. Hmm? The first act that I want to mention, my beloved brothers and sisters, and I have a whole load of acts, especially the magic related issues I want to get onto that inshallah ta'ala is swearing on your mother's life or on your father's life or on your children's life I'll be the first to admit brothers and sisters that as kids growing up it was very very moist on our tongues at least galalik let's be honest with ourselves I myself fell into it how many times if you say to that individual say wallahi I'll say wallahi billahi tallahi أليس كذلك بلا say والله بالله تعالى so much so that the name of Allah عز وجل lost its worth that when you say والله بالله تعالى nobody believes you anymore even the kafirs the kuffar in music tracks they start saying والله now in music tracks they start saying والله because of it being so common amongst the people Especially among Somalis. I don't, hear, I don't see any Somalis here. Huh? Very, very common. Wallahi, billahi, tallahi. I come from that community. They're in Leicester. 
And I go on about it all the time. Nobody believes you when you say, Wallahi billahi tallahi. Tayyip, you say, I swear on my dead nun's grave. Or I swear on my children's life. Just the other day when I was solving some marriage related issues between a relative of mine and his wife. You know, one of the things that she mentioned was, whenever I catch him out, he starts swearing on his children's lives. Swearing by other than Allah Azza wa Jal falls under which category? We spoke about three categories of sins. Which category will they fall into? Major shirk, minor shirk or major sins? It varies between minor shirk and also major. Depending on how that individual is taking an oath. But at least we could say is what? Minor shirk, which is so, so dangerous. What's my evidence for it? Because none of you guys should take anything from me unless I mention evidence. Man halafa bi ghayri lahi faqad ashrak. Whoever swears by other than Allah, he has committed shirk. I never said that. Your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that over 1400 years ago. How desensitized we've become to someone now swearing by other than Allah Azza wa I went to Egypt, right? Sometimes a child comes running towards you saying, please give me some money, right? One Nabi, one Nabi, one Nabi. What does one Nabi mean? He's now swearing by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is very, very common and moist on the tongues of the Egyptians especially. One Nabi. Right? I remember one time I made a video many, many years ago. Some brothers in Saudi Arabia got upset. Apparently they want to pull me into a meeting. Right? Taiba, sit down with the brother and you can see he's become so furious. Why has he become so furious? He says, that video that you've done. And I think somebody sent it to him. Because he used to swear by Allah, I swear by other than Allah Azza wa It's like, how can you say that this is worse than sleeping with your mother, right? Impregnating her and then end, you end up taking her life. And then you talked about minor sins and major sins. I was like, what do you mean? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu will say لِأَنْ أَحْلِفْ بِاللَّهِ كَاذِبًا That I swear by Allah while lying is more beloved to me than me swearing by other than Allah Azza wa Jal when speaking the truth. Right? Look how they looked at it. Look how they looked at it brothers and sisters. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who looked at it with them limbs. He's looking at it with that particular lens. So this is the first thing, brothers and sisters, that is very, very common, that I wanted to really touch on. And we really have to make toba from that. And if we become used to it, we have to what? Really cleanse in our tongues from this very dangerous statement. Many people think that shirk is only what? If you go to a grave and you prostrate towards it or you prostrate to it the next point that I want to mention my brothers and my sisters is that which relates to talismans the issue of talismans overlaps with magic related issues but we'll quickly make a mention of it now inshallah ta'ala Put your hand up if you've come across a ta'weez that you've actually seen a ta'weez. That's most people. Has anyone here ever opened the ta'weez? I'm going to honestly ask you guys to tell me what's inside of these ta'weez. Magic squares from the Kabbalah. You know magic squares is what's inside there. It's got names of Quran and Haman. Fadhallah alayk. Have you seen that with your own eyes? Because I was exactly about to mention that, but maybe because I mentioned it, people will think, oh, this guy has a particular agenda, that Wahhabi. Huh? But if somebody in the crowd who himself has opened up a ta'weez and found within it the names of Qarun and Haman and Fir'aun and Sahih, I've personally witnessed, you guys know Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, their names in the ta'weez, and that person, and I'm telling him, please open it up. 
He's saying, no, I shouldn't. He's got the names of Allah and Quran. He opens it up. What does he find? The names of all of these devils. These satanic symbols. Fir'aun, Qarun, Haman, Shaytan, Iblis, Abu Lahab. Right? So you, my brothers and my sisters, if you don't believe me, go and check yourselves. Do your own research, check it out, and see what you find. And we have to be brothers and sisters very soft and gentle with our brothers and sisters. Who might be uneducated, right? Can't be rough and tough. Yes, we know there's a narration that you should cut it off. Huh? But it might be better to take a very different approach, especially in today's day and age, when there are so many doubts that are being so easily embraced. Before I move on to the next one, brothers and sisters, I want you all to understand something. And that is, jinn possession, jinn possession, being possessed by the jinn, is more likely when you give service to the shaitan. How do you give service to the shaitan? Allah Azza wa Jal clearly and explicitly tells us this in Surah An-Nahl. I want us to take away this principle. Right? At least we have an idea as to why an individual might become possessed by the jinn. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانَهُ إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ the shaitan only has authority over who? Those who befriend him. How do you befriend the shaitan? By doing that which pleases him. What pleases him? Major shirk, minor shirk, and the major sins that an individual may find himself carrying out. I'll give you guys another evidence. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. How close was the shaytan to him? How close was the shaytan to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Naam, the shaytan would run away from him. Why? Because Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to be laxed huh? with sins and that which displeases Allah azza wa jalla. The Prophet ﷺ said about him, Wallahi la yakhafu minka shaytan ya Umar. By Allah, shaytan is scared of you. Never does the shaytan take a particular path except, sorry, never does Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu take a particular road or a pathway except the shaytan will take another. That is because his iman was sky high. He was a person of ta'a, obedience, worship, fulfilling the commandments of Allah azza wa jalla. Does that make sense? And because of that, the shaitan used to be terrified of him. The scholars they took from that, the more one carries out acts of obedience, the more his iman is intact, the further away the shaitan will be from that individual. Tayyib, very common question is, as soon as I started practicing, the jinn began to react within me. Doesn't this just go against what I just mentioned? He just started practicing the shaitan should be what? Far away from him. Why is it only now that the shaitan started reacting? Men yujibuni. Who can give an answer? The shaitan tends to possess you when, brothers and sisters? When you're gambling, right? When you're maybe drinking, especially when you do drugs. The chances of you becoming possessed by the shaitan is very likely. When a woman, right, takes off hijab and does all sorts of things, what is the likelihood that the shaitan will go and attack her? Very likely. We already know, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when a woman leaves the house, what does the shaitan do? Istashrafaha. He will beautify her in the eyes of men. The more sins she carries out, the more likely she is to be possessed. And the scholars, they conclude that women tend to be possessed more than men. Why is that? When they are off their salawat and their siyam, they're on their menses. They're not praying, right? 
So they're already, as women, they're very vulnerable. Even more vulnerable now. Right? Even more vulnerable in this part, particular case. When she's not praying and she's not doing acts of worship. Does that make sense? And even more so if she's now carrying out sins or that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? She can be so much more easily be victimized by the shaitan. Does that make sense? So this qa'id, brothers and sisters, إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَ Allah tells us those who befriend the shaitan. He only has authority over them. Right? And those who commit acts of shirk. Those who commit acts of shirk, the shaitan will have authority over them. Controlling them. Using them. Right? Look what Allah then says straight after that. إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكُّلُونَ It was actually the verse before that. The shaitan does not have authority over those. Right? The shaitan does not have authority over those who believe. And those who put their trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. I forgot to mention, subhanAllah. I asked you guys a question. I think I just jumped and digressed. Right? Why is it the shaitan only starts reacting the moment you start practicing? He possessed you at a time when you weren't practicing. And it's settled there. Why does he need to react? When you're committing all sorts of sins and you're engaged in filth and evil. But the moment you started practicing, you started spending more time in the house of Allah Azza wa You started doing acts of worship that pleases the Almighty. Began to what? Feel extremely irritated within. That's your answer. For why it all of a sudden started what? Reacting. And there are countless scenarios that I could give you, brothers and sisters. There was this relative that I was reading Ruqiyan, right? Of course, when you read Ruqiyan, relative, if that person is not your mahram, there has to be someone else there. Right? There's a third person. Red flag. If the Raqi, and there are many, Allahu A'lam, if they're even Ruqat Shari'a, if they are Raqis upon the Sharia, Rather, they are ruqat, many of them, who want to take advantage of women. A huge red flag is if the Raqi says, come and own, my sisters. Huge red flag. This goes against what the Messenger وسلم, advised. مَا خَلَى رَجْمِ عَمْرَاتٍ لَكَانَ ثَالِثُ الشَّيْطَانِ Never does a man seclude himself with a woman except that the third is shaitan. Big red flag. Be extra careful, even you as a husband or as a wali, as a guardian. When somebody is saying, listen, I'm going to, I don't care how long his beard is. Right? Or how long his thobe is, even if he's wearing green. Labas. I think today when I walked into the minbar, you guys thought that the masjid got take over, huh? <laughs> La, Sheikh is minor. Jayid. Tayyib. Does everybody get that? I don't care how righteous that individual thinks he is or looks. The fact that he asked to be alone with your wife or your sister or anyone else from your female relatives, huh? this is a big red flag. Alarm bell should be going off. Does that make sense? طيب. We hear statements such as what life has given me. Do we hear these statements quite often? What life has given me. Who is it that provides and sustains you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We have three categories of tawheed, right? Which has been extrapolated from the Quran. By the way, it wasn't a Wahhabi that came up with these three categories. There were people much before him, like Ibn Jarir, <coughs> Rahmatullahi Alayhi, the famous professor, who died hundreds of years before Sheikh Muhammad. Tayyib. Tawheed in your Rububiyya. Rububi is what? Lordship. The fact that Allah Azza wa Jalla is sustainer, He's the disposer of all affairs, and He's the Razzaq, He's the one that provides for you. And gives and grants. 
This is exclusive to Allah, right? Everyone else is just a means. My boss is just a means, and even then he's being provided for. Right? He's just a means. At the end of the day, it is Allah Azza wa Jalla that provides and sustains and grants and gives and takes away and so on and so forth. So when somebody now says, what life has given me, he might now be attributing to other than Allah Azza wa Jalla, which is what? Exclusive to him. If you now say that other than Allah is a razzah, is a provider, the ultimate provider and sustainer and disposer of all of his, what have you now committed? Shirk billahi azza wa jal. Even the mushrikeen and Quraysh, they never said that. Allah tells us in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They call on Allah. You ask them who created the heavens and the earth? They will say Allah. Who is the disposer of all of us? Allah. Who is the provider? Allah. They believe that. It's in the Quran, brothers and sisters. Their shirk was in something else. Placing intermediaries between themselves and Allah. That was the shirk they fell into. What were these intermediaries? These idols that they had. And in today's day and age, people have what? Righteous individuals who have passed away. That they have placed as intermediaries between themselves and Allah. Going back to the point that I was making. Saying what life has given me. Life doesn't give you anything. It's Allah as well gives you. And these statements that we utter with our tongues, brothers and sisters, because it's unintended, it would fall under what? Minor shirk. Shirku al alfad The shirky statement that slips off our tongues that one needs to what? Clean his tongue from and his language from. Does that make sense? However, if he did mean it, then it's even more dangerous. You're asking huh, to fall under that first category. Or something that I had written down, I forgot to mention. You know, in the COVID period, Wallahi witnesses with my own eyes, a ta'weez being sold for 279 pounds. I believe it was either on eBay or Amazon. I remember taking a screenshot of it and putting it on Twitter. And, these ta- and in the description, it had something like, This ta'weez will help you get through it, and the pandemic, and Madriyash were. People are actually buying it. Who remembers what happened right at the end of 2021? On Twitter. It's the last day before 2022 kicks in. What were the people posting on Twitter? Does anyone remember? World War Three? No, that's just now. Huh? Happy New Year? No, before Happy New Year, huh? So what were they referring to, or what were they saying about the year that just passed? Huh, Sheikh? How bad the year was? They were insulting it. F in this, F in that. Huh? Insulting this year that just went by. And speaking ill about this COVID that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. Are you scared? All over Twitter. Very, very widespread. Huh? And prevalent. What's the problem with this? Is there really a problem with this? Let me ask you a question. The time and that which happens within the time. Huh? Who is that controlled by? What did the Messenger وسلم, say about not insulting the wind and not insulting the time? He said, Let's subrih. Don't insult the wind. Also, the Messenger وسلم, said, Let's subudahar. Don't insult the time. Why is that, brothers and sisters? Who is it controlled by? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger وسلم, said about the wind, It has been instructed, it has been commanded. By who? By none other than Allah Azza wa If you now constructed a building, right, and I walked past and started insulting the building, am I insulting the building or insulting the builder? Huh? 
Yani the, the building is going to respond back to me and feel sad, like, why, why are you insulting me? Who in essence am I actually insulting? None other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the time we don't actually mean it. If we did mean it, that would even be more serious. SubhanAllah. Can you see how many things that we might fall into, right? Unintentionally. Ma'al Asif is shadeed. SubhanAllah. Very sorry to say. This has an impact on one's tawheed. Which could possibly even lead it to what? Cancelling it altogether. Removing it altogether. I've also got written down here, I wrote a very, very long time ago. Visiting Babu Ali. Have you guys heard of Babu Ali? Every now and again, a yellow postcard comes through my door. You know what he says on there? Visit Babu Ali or call Babu Ali. What kind of services does Babu Ali provide? If you are having marriage related issues, if you feel down, depressed, sad, right? If you need a quick fix for your marriage, a quick fix to your problems, you've been sacked by your boss and you want to go back into work, call this number. Identifying brothers and sisters, Identifying who the real sheikh, the real alim is, and who in essence is what? A fake. There was a time when I gave a khutbah about this particular topic. The khutbah was about Harry Potter, and David Blaine, and Dynamo, and Britain's Got Talent. Lesh, today's day and age, that which we have embraced, wholeheartedly or that which we take pleasure in is the entertainment that has been made so easily accessible to us people are sitting around watching these magic tricks and these magic shows right Britain's Got Talent has some of these shows right and we're just enjoying ourselves entertainment huh are we reading these magic books like Harry Potter Spelling Arm and Madriyash and all of that stuff. Kids from a very young age, they become so desensitized to magic. Right? We buy them the wands and the hats and the clothes of a magician. Right? And they begin to act like them. So from a very young age, they become desensitized. And as they grow older, uneducated, right? They may be going through certain problems in life and then this card comes through the door. You've been making dua for so long, you're probably thinking that this is what the answer to all of your problems. And then it says on there, visit Babu Ali for a quick fix or call Babu Ali for a quick fix. Ends up calling and yes, we ended up calling the Sahir to expose him and threaten him as well. Right? And then all of a sudden, subhanAllah, these cards stopped coming through the door. He used to what post it to the whole block. It's a 15, or should I say 16, right, floor building. Okay, we put it through all of them. Who's putting it through the, the post? Allahu A'lam. Maybe some jinn he sent. Because I would never hear it coming through the door. Allahu A'lam. One goes to these peer subs or these sorcerers and Babu Ali and whatever have you, thinking that he is now going through some Islamic therapy. We have a guy in Leicester, he's got the latest CCTV camera in front of his door. Right? And that is because he's been attacked in the past. The man sells ta'weezes. The man sells ta'weezes. And apparently he's filthy rich. Because he sells them. He's making money out of them. You know, earlier I talked about 279 pounds. Allah what the man is charging. Got the latest cars in his driveway. CCTV as well. 
just in case somebody wants to harm him. Huh? Telling you that you know how you go to the medicine, uh, how you go to the pharmacy to get paracetamol. This is no different, but this is a shari alternative, right, brothers and sisters. Arruqya, something very very simple. This is why I really go out my way to push the concept of self ruqya. And our brother of Sadd Muhammad Tim Humble, when you type onto Google, right, self ruqya, a self ruqya program, I think it is, with his name, Sadd Muhammad Tim Humble, practical steps come up on a link that you can, inshallah ta'ala, follow to help yourself. You don't need to go to some Pirsa or to some Babu Ali or some sorcerer or some sheikh that you think is a sheikh. I'm not saying you don't go to Araqi. There are those who, when you go to them, will read some Quran on you. Right? And when that individual reads Quran on your brothers and sisters, as Ibn Hajar mentions, three conditions. Right? That which he says, he's using the Quran and the Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah. I think the second condition is also using the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then the third, it has to be something mafhum that can be understood. Not just him what? Huh? Mumbling and tell you guys something that happened. Wallahi al-Azim, brothers and sisters, I'm not adding something or taking something out. It's exactly how it happened. I was in Yemen. And I was on a very, very intense Quran program. Very, very intense. I would sit for around 19 to 20 hours every day. Right? And then once, just khalas, shut down. Burnt out. Which is very expected and predictable. When you are pushing yourself to that extent, right? And even at the end of that 20 hours, it's like you've only memorized or should I say barely anything, it's going to get to you. And eventually I just shut down. I got taken to the sick room. In the institute they had a sick room. This is before I went to study in the Maj, right? I was at a Sufi institute in Hadramaut. And I was advised to go to. I heard about this man. If you go and sit with him, he will cure you. I didn't know any better. Decided to go to him. Wallahi, brothers and sisters. I'm walking into his house, literally about to collapse. Because of how mentally and physically exhausted I have become. I'm sick to the core. I just walked out of the sick room. I just walked out of the sick room that has all of the ill students. And I'm literally holding the wall as I'm walking in. I sit in front of him, Wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi, brothers and sisters. The man started mumbling. I've learned Quran to some degree. I can understand, even if I don't know Arabic, and at the time I had a decent level of Arabic, right? And if somebody's reading the Quran, I can understand that he's reading the Quran. I can hear it clearly. The guy would literally speaking like that. And it is as if the sickness was pulled out of me that very moment. I stood up and I even started doing this with my hand. Is that, is that normal? And just like, you know how you start moving your leg? To see whether this is real or not. Straight away, instantly. Whatever medicine you bring me, I don't think I will become cured that quickly. Right? You may ask, oh, he could have been a righteous man, whatever have you, and this and that. Remember, brothers and sisters, even if you see a guy walking on water, as Imam Shafi, rahmatullahi says, you see him walking on water, it could be that jinns are carrying him. Is that possible without a shadow of a doubt? For anyone who has looked into the world of jinns, that's very well possible. Very well possible. That's why Imam Shafi would say, I wouldn't believe him. If that person was not a punter, I wouldn't believe him. So as I mentioned, the Rukhya is something that the Messenger taught us. It's pretty clear and evident. And known 
how to go about it. Right? As for sitting in front of someone and mumbling your thing and then you don't know what the guy is saying and he may well be calling a jinn or a whatever it might be. And, huh? Have you guys heard of zodiac signs? Who can tell me a little bit about it? Huh? Tfaddal. They predict your future. Hey, what else? Star signs, huh? Future events. Jameen, they use shayateen to find out about future events, huh? Sorry? They base your personality off the month that you're born in. You know, when I was coming back from Australia, I came back literally two days ago. And I nearly missed the khutbah today as well. You know what time you arrived? 1.29 One minute before the khutbah starts Because of my jet lag I don't know what I did to the alarm Brothers were waiting for me for over an hour and a half Brother Yahya, may Allah bless him was Standing in front of the train station for an hour and a half Like in Alhamdulillah with Some decent driving We managed to get here on time Driving on the hard shoulders and whatever have you May Allah forgive us. Point of the matter is, I'm on the flight, brothers. I just woke up because it's a 20 hour flight from Sydney or Melbourne to New Delhi in India. It's approximately 12 hours. Another eight hours. Uh, another eight hours from New Delhi to London. Just woke up, jet lagged. I look to my right and I see the subtitles of. I think it was a Bollywood movie. My eyes straight away, huh? Connected to what was on the subtitles. You know what he said? Go and visit the astrologist. And he will tell you when you're going to die. No? Huh? Astrologist, astrology, you guys heard of it, right? There's a type of astrology that has absolutely no issues, right? That can be studied pertaining to the moon and gives you a very good idea of when you should uh, water, when you should plant and so on and so forth. Right? Anyways, that's a whole different issue. He's saying, and I'm reading this from the subtitles because I think it was a sister or a guy or I can't remember who it was, was watching this Bollywood movie. Go visit the astrologist so he can tell you when you're going to die. It's like, alhamdulillah, let me write that as another example. This is in Bollywood movies, brothers and sisters. When you keep watching something, would we all agree that one becomes extremely desensitized to that which might be grave and fallacious? Very much so. You know the scholars of the past, they would say, don't look at lazy people. Why? They would tell someone with high aspirations not to keep looking at someone who's lazy. Limada, because subconsciously, you will see it creeping into an, in, to an individual and then you'll see himself, he'll see himself behaving like that individual that he kept on looking at. That's why Raghub al-Asfahani, rahmatullahi alayhi, says, one doesn't just become affected by the surroundings of what is said in front of him or what is done in front of him but also by that which one keeps looking at when you keep scrolling through these TikTok reels and these Instagram reels you see yourself picking up certain habits That's where a no-go zone for you. But now all of a sudden, subconsciously is creeped in. Begins to affect your behavior. You see young men walking around now, right? Uh, he's walking a certain way. And he doesn't realize that, uh, that there's nothing wrong with it. Or he has a particular haircut. You say to him, why have you? He goes, what, what do you mean? What's, what's wrong with it? Just skin fade, like, you know? The hair's out like that. I'm not having, having a go at you. <laughs> no, not at you. Like in, in Leicester, Right, especially within the Somali community, that's my community. I have to deal with it all the time. 
And they don't see. It's become like everyone has it. Where did they take it from? They took it from these rappers and whatever. Have and that's because they keep on looking at them. Huh? Day and night. Constantly looking at them. Day and night. Does that make sense? Subconsciously it creeps in. You see yourself behaving and acting a certain way. Your brothers came to Leeds, right? That's why, where did I see your brothers? And I was not having to go at you guys. Honestly. Don't take it the wrong way. Inshallah. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? So, now within Hollywood or Bollywood or Somaliwood, all of these stuff have been what? Embedded. From a very young age, brothers and sisters, look at this, right? Harry Potter was, or should I, you know, how can I put this? Was the one that everybody was so glued to. I watched, me personally, watched every episode or every uh, film that came out. Because how much we loved it. I remember even now, right? I still remember it. I asked my dad, can I go to the cinema? The school's going to, they're watching Harry Potter. And I was in secondary school at the time. I was like, everybody's going, can I go as well? Hmm? That which they say in these movies, right? You know when they visit the magician or the sorcerer and then they've got that magic ball. Huh? And these potions that we grew up seeing when watching Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. As you grow older, you continue to keep seeing this in these Bollywood, Hollywood, Somaliwood movies. And then you might eventually end up even doing it because it's become a norm. And it's very, very common where the zodiac signs on which particular app? Snapchat. I call it Wasakh chat. Huh? Which translates to be in English as filth chap. Filth chat, not chap. Chat. Which I think most of you guys would agree. Huh? Tayyib, I heard it's big on there. I was even sent some screenshots. Of it. Huh? Find out about your zodiac signs. I remember subhanAllah likewise when I was in secondary school. There were some boys and girls sitting around and they were talking about these zodiac signs that you find on the back of a newspaper. Which month were you born in? Somebody's asking me. March. I'm born in March. Taib, your zodiac, your zodiac sign is this. And then they, Allah, the other day, brothers and sisters, I was dealing with a marriage related issue. A brother was having, of course, issues in his marriage. And there's no marriage except that it has issues. This fairy tale understanding that many millennials have in today's day and age is a myth. Huh? Where he's going to come home every day with eight, nine roses and he's gonna, huh, on the bed. Oh, wallahi. It's a myth, brothers and sisters. So there's bound to be what? Problems. In every marriage, there's not a marriage that is problem free. Tayyip, Jameel. They were having problems. He considered a divorce. You know what helped him make that decision of divorcing his wife? Because of the zodiac signs being different. Because it's not going to work anyway because of this and that. This was a determining factor. Hmm? And all of this, brothers and sisters, is that which either diminishes our Tawheed or leads to our Tawheed being what? Cancelled altogether. Oh, I like this one. Evil omens. Superstitions that people have today. Let's quickly run through a couple. Walking under the ladder. I remember when I was growing up, you had these poles that has signposts. Every time one of us walked through it, we'd punch him. He walked through the Batman's legs. Isn't that so? He walked through the Batman's legs and if I don't punch him, he will have bad luck for the rest of the day. (coughs) 
These superstitious beliefs, brothers and sisters, is not something that is new, they're very ancient. This is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La tiyarata wa la safara wa la ham. He negated these badly omens that people had. If they wanted to go out on their travels, what would they do? They would take a bird. If the bird went left, they wouldn't go. If it went right, okay, it's a good idea for me to go today. I'm not going to be struck with some evil that may have struck me had the bird gone left. The occurrences that are taking place in the cosmic universe now is being attributed to who? To a bird. When it should be attributed to who? To Allah. You guys heard of the black cat? What happens if the black cat crosses your path? What do people believe? All the kind of superstitious sentiments that people have? Huh? Bad luck, right? So what do I need to do? Do I need to punch him? In order for him to... Huh? You have to walk backwards 10 steps. Is that real or is that from you? Yeah. <laughs> But I don't personally know. I, but... Subhanallah. Let me give you guys some other ones as well. Saying the word Macbeth or wishing someone good luck while inside of a theater. This brings about what? Huh? Coming to that. <laughs> Giving a clock as a gift in Chinese culture, right? Yani as in Chinese, right? To give a clock has the same pronunciation as attending their funeral. Opening an umbrella while indoors. I remember one time I did that and somebody said, oh no, you shouldn't do that. There's some evil omens that are attached to it. Hmm. Putting shoes on the table. New shoes, you bought it, walked inside of the house and then you put it on the table. You see that's bad luck. Or that you're going to be struck with some evil. Failing to respond back to a chain letter. Ah. Oh. I remember before all of these phones came about, we'd receive emails. That's all of this information. If you don't send it to 30 people or 40 people or 50 people, we'd get scared then you will be struck with kada wa kada wa kada wa kada. Uh, some of you millennials might not necessarily know what I'm speaking about, but the elders who used to be on MSN, right? We'd receive these emails quite often. And today it goes around where? On WhatsApp. At least that goes around. Breaking a mirror is said to bring about seven years of bad luck. Friday the 13th is bad luck. Samir Tamanhala, Friday the 13th. If a Friday falls on the 13th of that month, then it brings about bad luck. Taib. I have another one written down, which is very common. <laughs> Saying, why always me? Why always me? Why can't it be so-and-so? Not understanding the perfect plan of Allah Azza wa Jal could really lead an individual to Speaking to Allah Azza wa Jalla in a boisterous, disrespectful way. Why always me? Why can't it be him? Right? Do you not see, O oh man and woman, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may choose something in particular for you, which is the best, but you don't actually see it there and then? How often have we been in a situation where things happened? Give you guys an example of marriage. There's a lot of youth. It's marriage season as well. 
You're desperately trying to marry her. Desperately trying to marry her. You think that she is what Prince is charming that will never ever come along again. Everything you try in your power just doesn't seem to happen. You begin to say, why? Why? She's the best for me. Right? It just doesn't seem to be happening. Years down the line, subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal grants you a woman that you couldn't imagine. Only then you say, oh, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have this today. Have we been in this kind of settings and situations? I myself, subhanAllah, recently desperately tried to apply for, well, I desperately tried to get in for the master's program in Al-Medina. Right? I tried my utmost best. Everybody around me got accepted for a master's program. My Russian friend, my Algerian friend, my Libyan friend, my Nigerian friend, every single one of them got accepted. I got initially nominated and everyone thought, Khalas, he's going to get in. And then guess what? Everybody gets in except me. Right? Am I going to turn around and say, why me? Why, why are you doing this to me? Huh? That you believe in the good of the Qadr and also that which looks to you to be what? Bad. But that's very subjective. How we see things. Of course, I was disappointed. I'm going to be honest. Later on, I found that. And at the time I applied for Aqidah, I didn't want to do Aqidah for Masters. I wanted to do Fiqh. But it was like as a last resort because getting into the fiqh department for masters, there were some issues. Right? I come back not knowing what I'm going to do next. Just going with the flow. Doing my istikhara from time to time. I receive a message saying that you've been accepted to do your masters in Jami'at al-Imam in Riyadh. For which department? Fiqh. Can you see, brothers and sisters, how weak our intellects are? How limited it is. Why can't these atheists accept, right, that your minds are limited, just like your sight is limited. What you can see is limited. What you can hear is limited. What you can smell is limited. All of these are organs that Allah Azza wa created. They're all limited. Why is it that you can't accept that your mind is limited as well? They begin to question why this is like that and why this is that and... They amongst themselves dispute and argue what is morally acceptable and what is not. Once upon a time there were certain things that were morally unacceptable in society. Like smoking weed, even homosexuality. According to American law, only up until recently it started becoming morally acceptable. Things are changing over time as man develops and learns. He uncovers new things. So they begin to change. Do you know until this very day, what do they call it? Cannibalism. Huh? That's what they call it, right? It's perfectly fine in some societies. Perfectly fine. Do you guys know what that means? To eat another human. It's perfectly moral and acceptable. There's no issue with it whatsoever. Right? Things change. Amongst yourselves you will find disputes as to what we should do and what we shouldn't. Or how we should live our lives and how we should structure it. Does that make sense brothers and sisters? Huh? This is why we have no option except to accept that there is an external entity that should put down the law for us. Otherwise man will never agree with another of what is morally acceptable. We are indeed, we are in need of being feathered and governed by a sharia. Think about it now, take Islam out of the equation. When I was in India, I came across this Irish brother who was on the same flight as me. He was by himself and he was talking to me about, a non-Muslim guy, he was talking to me about how his girlfriend cheated on him 
for our perfect opportunity now to give him da'wah. Huh? We're in India, New Delhi. Five hour, right? Transit. We start talking, talking, talking. I said, what was your issue with her? She was like, oh, I'm overprotective. And then I, all of a sudden I found out that she was sending pictures of herself to different guys. Taib. One of the things I said to him was, would you agree that what is morally acceptable has become blurred in society? He's like, yes. Taib. Do you have a problem with your girlfriend walking around with revealing clothes? Because this is what they do in society and everything. And so you don't have a problem with her walking around wearing revealing clothes while other men are going to be looking at her. But you have a problem with her sending pictures to somebody else. Where do we draw the line, my friend? You may say that certain things is considered cheating and unacceptable. And other things are perfectly fine. When another would say, no, this is unacceptable as all. You will come across a woman that you want to start a life with. Everyone has different standards and different ways of looking at things. Right? Especially with the red pill movement and the feminist movement. Huh? I think everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? The feminists, they feel as if the men are over-controlling. They're toxic. While the other side now wants to treat women a certain way. Everybody looks at things differently. Whose way are we going to take? Right? This is why we need an external entity to govern us, to feather us, to teach us how we should live our lives. How long do I have, Sheikh? I'm just going off on attention here. Huh? No, honestly, how long, how long have we gone, for, gone on for? We've gone on for an hour. Taib, let me move on to... Well, there's so many things that I have written down here. Saying things like so and so deserves better. Huh? My hard work got me to this. He got what he deserved. There are issues with all of these statements that I would have loved to. Huh? Stand over. Tayyib. Let's go on to some magic practices that I think will intrigue every single one of you. There's a type of magic, my beloved brothers and sisters. It's called Sihr al The shoulder blade magic. You know what they do? They take the shoulder blade of a slaughtered sheep. They go to the butcher, they specifically buy the bone. Some butchers, they will sell it for extorted amounts. Some brothers and sisters, right? And some butchers, may Allah Azza wa reward them. As soon as they've slaughtered it, they've taken the meat of the shoulder, what would they do? They would take the ketif and get rid of it. Because they know there are those who are ready to pounce on any shoulder blade that they could use for magic spells. I have an image right here. Some of you guys may be able to see it. This is a shoulder blade. And there's all of these writings on there. These numerics, these words that are on there, right? After having written whatever they needed to write on there as magicians, what do they do to it? They leave it somewhere in the open that can probably not be found. You know, it rains, sah? It rains. And then it gets dry, and it rains again, it gets dry. The more dry it becomes, زاد العذاب والألم. The pain increases. Huh? And the effects becomes worse. Subhanallah. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the butchers, what they would do, they would break it. Or they would get rid of it. Just so it cannot be used. This man. And some they're ready to pay extorted amounts and then the butcher is having a field day, right? Ah, oh, yes. Ketif, khalas, let me now sell it for a ridiculous amount. And then that magician goes, writes stuff on there, huh? does his magic spells on there, and then sells it for an amount that you can't imagine. 
people are ready to buy it. People are ready to buy it, brothers and sisters. And the reasons behind it are the following, brothers and sisters. You will find that magic, brothers and sisters, will come into effect with the permission of Allah Azza wa Did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have a magic spell done on him? Yes, there was. Huh? The end of his life. Number one, في تفريق الأزواج بالبغض والكر. Right. Have you guys heard of the story of Babylon? That is mentioned in the Quran. Right. Two angels came down, and this is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. I believe is the 16th page on the Sa- Saudi printed masahif. These two angels that came down, brothers and sisters, were called Harut and Marut, and they came to the city of Babylon. This, brothers and sisters, is based in Iraq, right? They say there was not a city before Babylon. It was the, the most ancient city that you will ever come to know about. The first real civilization was Babylon. And it's referred to in the Quran as Babel. Right? Before Ibrahim, we're going back to the earliest of times here, before Musa, before Sulaiman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down these two angels with the knowledge of how to control and access the jinn. They were sent and they were allowed to teach anyone who wanted to study with them the art of magic. These two angels, brothers and sisters, they came to the people. Right? They would offer to teach them magic. However, they would come with a huge disclaimer. What was this huge disclaimer? إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ We are indeed a fitna. We are a test for you guys. Do not commit kufr. Right? Those who learnt it, they were the first magicians. What were they learning? فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They will learn from them how to separate between husband and wife. Allah has profound brothers and sisters. You will see an individual who really loves his wife. Right? Suddenly, he has this strong hatred towards her. This strong aversion towards her. Doesn't want anything to do with her. Right? You ask him, what's the problem? Let's talk there. No, no, I don't want to. It's times like that when one should really think outside of the box. Maybe there's something else going on here. Right? Of course, there are problems between husband and wife. It might be that the wife does certain things that he doesn't like and he's just had enough. He goes, you know what? Done. Khalas. She's made me sick and tired. I'm sure some of you husbands can testify to that. Huh? But she gets under your central nervous system. And she doesn't stop. And you're saying, Ya Allah. What we're talking about, subhanAllah, there's nothing going on. Of course, you're going to always find these squabbles. Then all of a sudden, huh, turns around and says, you know what, I don't want her. He doesn't have the desire to have intimacy with his wife. All of a sudden, it's like there's a block between them both. Number two, one is not interested in a particular woman, right? Or it could be that they were together and then he's just completely lost interest in her. Right? Because their personalities clash, they're not compatible towards one another, or whatever have you. So she takes a visit to the magician, pays whatever she needs to pay, and requests from the magician to do that which is called al atf To carry out this love spell between them both, which draws them close together. Another type, brothers and sisters, is Isqatul Hamm. A magic spell that is done in order to drop the child that she is uh, impregnated with. That she's carrying in her womb. A type of sihr that is done, brothers and sisters, 
that stops a woman now from having her monthly cycle. It could be that an individual decides to put a magic spell on you. All of a sudden you see a change of character in that individual committing all types of fawahish. That individual has such a good reputation. Right? He was looked up to in the, in the community and then all of a sudden brothers and sisters, the guy loses control of himself. He starts doing all sorts of filthy, immoral, despicable, undesirable acts. From hero to zero, just like Hakada, overnight. It could be brother and sister, someone's done something to him. Another one that I've written down here is Right? There is a good family, very strongly knitted or closely knitted, and then because of someone going through problems within his family, he just can't bear to see. This family prospering. So he takes a visit to the magician to get a magic spell done on that individual. When I'm still, if you had a kathir, our brothers and sisters, there's so many different other examples that I have written down here. Another one that I really do want to make mention of is that which relates to. A type of sihr, it might be that an individual writes it down on a leaf or on some paper and then he hangs it somewhere, right? Or on some material, some clothes it's written on, which is then hung. Every time the wind blows this piece of garment or this piece of paper, you see it, or you see the sihr coming into effect. Reeling, having a toll on this individual who's had sihr done on him. Right? There are some books that have been put together, brothers and sisters, pertaining to uh, a sihr and whatever have you. Maybe another time, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll go into it. A lot more detail, we've gone well over the time. I will conclude with the story of when I visited a magician, what actually happened. We can maybe, inshallah ta'ala, take some signs of a magician from that. When I was in Yemen, when I was in Yemen, once upon a time I lost my Blackberry. Do you guys remember the Blackberries? BBI? BBM message, huh? I had one of those white blackberries at the time and it was, of course, one of those phones that was highly coveted at the time, right? It happened to be that I lost my phone and my cousin lost his camera around the same time. What do I do? There were rumors going around that there is a lady called Habab Shifa. What does Shifa mean? Miss Cure. Hababa, the beloved. What does she do? Apparently she cures. It sounded a little bit off to me. So I went to the head sheikh in the institute and I asked him, Ya sheikh, I have lost my camera and my cousin has lost his phone. People are telling me to go to this lady called Habab Shifa. Shall I go to her? He said, yes. So we decided to take a visit to this lady called Habab Shifa. We went to the taxi area and was like, can you take us to Habab Shifa? He was like, yeah, 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 I know, time. Straight away the guy knew where the house was. As if to say, yeah, it's pretty common. Everybody goes there all the time. Ma'i? Tayyip. We get into the car and he drives us there. He says, there's the house, go there. Ring the bell. He drives off. Ring the bell, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, la ilaha ghayru. The first thing that she asked me was, what is your mother's name? And what's your grandmother's name? What's your father's name? And what is your grandfather's name? 
And me being naive and uneducated, I just told her. Dad's name is this, my granddad's name is that. Gave her all of the names. Cousin done the same thing. I go back to the institute, right? And of course now, I mean, because I lived inside of the institute, there would be normally nine people in the same room. Nine people in the same room. Three, three, three. It was a big room. Everyone had their own little space. And you had your books to the side. One of the brothers who sleeps in the room said that there was this American brother who walked in, tried to wake you up. And he was around your sleeping area. So now we have a suspect. I go up to this individual and I tell him, listen, you were seen sniffing around my sleeping area. And there is huge suspicion that you are the one that took the phone. He said, no, it wasn't me. Wah, 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 ila akhira, I'm leaving tonight. And yes, he was actually traveling back to America. I don't want any problems. Don't give me any issues. You know what? I'll give you my phone. Take it. If I accuse any of you for taking my phone, would anybody just say, you know what? Take my iPhone. I don't want any problems. Just like that. Would anybody do that? You're going to stand there and fight your case. Alayhi kadalik? Bala. He gives me the exact same phone that went missing. It's like, okay. The exact same white Blackberry. So we leave. Now I start checking the phone. I realized huh? the headset is not working. And you call, you know the sound? You can't hear anything. It's like, no, I'm not having this. So I went back to the guy. I was like, hey, you take your phone. I'm going to deal with this tonight. So we spoke to the principal of the institute and he was like, listen, go back to him. Make sure you get your phone. He did take the, take the phone. And he said it with some certainty. Allah alam. Was he personally dealing with jinns? I don't know. He said, with certainty, go and take your phone. And I'm on my way as well. He has your phone. So we go there and there was a huge exposure. We managed to retrieve the phone in front of his parents who are just about to leave back to America after maybe over 10 years in that institute. I think it was 10 years, Allahu A'lam. About a very long time. You can imagine how broken his parents would be. We brought our children here to become righteous individuals, educated, and this is the last thing that he's done. Tayyip, to cut a very long story short, I went back, I was like, let me just get on with my day now. And my studies, my cousin goes, listen, I came with you yesterday. Now I want you to come back with me today. Then let's go. Go back to the lady. And ring the bell. Little girl comes running. She was like, here, my auntie gave you guys these two papers that are wrapped up. Here, take it. And she said, don't open it. Go and put it under the stone. Go and put it under the stone. But like, don't open it. Me, I was very curious, right? The kind of person that I am. And I, of course, already found my phone. She was like, go and put it on the sun, you'll find it. I decided to open it. Wallahi, brothers and sisters. It had all of these scribbles. These scribbles. With some verses of the Quran. Huh? Mingled with all of these scribbles and this funky type of handwriting. I got so scared, I wrapped it up and I took it under the stone. My cousin didn't open it because he wants his camera back, right? Takes it, puts it under another huge rock. Brothers, I kid you not. The one who stole his camera came to him mixing up his words. Shaking. Here, take your camera. And I witnessed that with my own eyes. You know who that was? The one who was guarding the institute. Because at the time, my cousin left it in the charger inside of the musalla. He happened to be walking around on a Friday when most people leave to attend the Jum'ah in a big mosque. And I took it. Nobody knew who it was. He's the one that came shaking, him, shaking, mumbling up his words and whatever, and he gave it back like that. These are some signs, brothers and sisters. Right? As I mentioned right at the beginning, the most precious thing to every single one of us is what? A tawheed. And there are many things that could destroy it. Right? What I mentioned today is only like a drop in the sea of what is out there to learn. Huh? From the things that cause your tawheed to diminish or to be cancelled altogether. And the different types of magic and whatever have you. Inshallah, maybe one day we'll do a, a PowerPoint course and I'll show you guys proper samples. 
uh, of some of these. Uh, it'll be a workshop, inshallah. Maybe we'll do it one day. Maybe next year. Uh, like a, <laughs> may Allah reward Brother Arshad, right? And I feel really bad as well. The amount of times we try to organize a date and then I would cancel it and then we'd do it again and then we'd just become a... I really, really, you know, took him for a run, you know? SubhanAllah. May Allah reward him. He was very, very patient with me. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make me better in my communications because I'm very bad at it. Right? Brothers and sisters always say, oh, why don't you have a PA? No, I don't feel comfortable with that. Telling everybody, oh yeah, go speak to my PA. That, that's, that doesn't sit well with me at all. Even the brothers have said, let's deal with everything. I just don't feel comfortable with that. Doesn't feel good within the nafs. Especially with masajid that I used to deal with all of these years. Now I say, go and someone else speak to him. That. So I'm trying my utmost best, inshallah ta'ala. I hope Uncle Zafar and Brother Arshad, they, they understand. Next time I'll be a bit more organized, inshallah. We'll try and sort out a lot of things in the future I really feel good being in this masjid lovely glowing faces here as well may Allah bless every single one of you